G'day everyone and welcome to the Trek Zone Spotlight, Matt Miller with you. It's a massive weekend of Trek goodness as the official Star Trek convention in Vegas continues this morning. Some pretty exciting news. Carlos Pedraza will join me to dissect it right after this. My initial reaction to this news was one of disappointment because I felt that the guidelines uh, leveled the playing field for fan film producers around the world. Uh, but now licensing these sets and letting people come on board uh, and make their own fan films really tips the balance of power back to America. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? Because as James said, at this stage, there'll only be a couple of scripts that they'll uh, be producing and they won't be soliciting outside material. So it very much is is uh, a, a school, a learning about how Star Trek films and episodes are put together. I think that's a fair uh, criticism, but you have to remember that nothing like this has ever been done before by uh, any major studio turning over their IP to uh, a group of fans to do with as they will. Well, in this case, as they, the they and as they will is James Colley, and he's a known quantity to, to CBS. He's someone who's uh, shepherded uh, Star Trek well in, in the fan community. Um, he's built up a lot of, of credibility with CBS and, and they trust him. As James mentioned, the Fan Film Academy is coming up probably twice next year, spring and fall 2018, and he's looking at only doing it a couple of times a year. I think that's really cool because uh, it allows uh, a bigger concentration of people to attend uh, and some really cool special guests to come on board and, and part their knowledge. What do you think? The scheduling is interesting because uh, they're literally scheduling this around the busy season for uh, tourists coming to the uh, set tour that operates out of the same facility. So uh, the spring and the fall are the slowest parts of the year, so that's a natural time to schedule uh, the Film Academy sessions. Um, and I think you're exactly correct that uh, it will be easier for James to attract the kind of talent that he wants and needs to make this idea work if uh, the number of times they need to be there is limited and can be scheduled well in advance. Now this is pretty cool, Carlos. The man that is driving all of this change, James Corley, you got to sit down with him uh, just a short time ago and uh, this is the result. So, James, uh, tell us how this idea came to be. Well, you know, years ago when we were doing um, New Voyages fan films, we, several of us, you included, we used to talk about what it would be like if we could, you know, get a license to do things or could we do a film school or a film summer camp for Star Trek people. So it started way back then. And I just kind of put it aside. And then, of course, we licensed the Star Trek tour. And one of the things that I wanted to, to hopefully accomplish with the tour was um, uh, what they used to do at Universal Studios. I wanted to be able to have these little video postcards where the fans could come in, sit on the bridge and do a couple of lines and get a couple of special effects and take that home. And so I, I, you know, I, I pitched that to CBS and um, they had some, some discussions and, and uh, lo and behold, a short time ago we came back and we, we came up with this you know, bigger plan um, to to make it this way, more of a film school, a Star Trek film academy. So in the aftermath of the lawsuit, it, it sounds like CBS, CBS is really trying to ensure that fans understand that it wants to support fan films. This is a huge step for yeah. them to actually sort of license the creation of Star Trek IP that isn't directly being made by them, so yeah. um, so it's kind of a risk on their part. But you think worth it for them? I don't know if it's so much a risk. I think uh, in the end, this is this is just another product. Mm -hmm. It's a product. We want to we want to have the script. The you know we have the script. We'll break it down. We'll do a production meeting. We'll we'll talk about costuming. We'll talk about the makeup processes, the lighting. You know every aspect that we can include without slowing things down. We're going to have to stay on a specific schedule, you know, as any film production would, which of course you're well aware of. Mm -hmm. we have, so we want to walk them through the process of making the episode. And this really is, you know, a template that I forged when I first started. Because, you know, when we did, when I was doing fan films, you know, I always wanted to bring in Walter Koenig or George Takei, which we did. Mm -hmm. And and so 
this is a way for fans to kind of experience what I was very fortunate enough to be able to experience um, in making a fan film. This is, this is a way for them to come in and do it with real Star Trek staffers, people who worked on the show from the 60s to now and, and learn the process. So in other words, if we're gonna talk about something in the art department, the fans are gonna be able to do that with the Okudas or Doug Drexler or Darren Docterman, or if we're gonna talk about special effects, they can do it with Docterman. Whoever we bring in, um, you know, it's it's my dearest wish, you know, since we have access to all the people that work on Star Trek, that we're gonna be able to bring in some really good talent. We'll be able to bring in, you know, some directors from the show, some of the actors who have directed from the show. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my intent. It's just basically so that people can make these fun little films and rub elbows with their, with their heroes and experience Oh my gosh, this is what it's like to be on the show. So, um, so as a starting point, uh, you're seeing these short vignettes being being uh, produced uh, on a, on a week, weekly basis. About how many uh, people do you foresee in going through a class at any in any given well, week? Well, I, I think initially, my, you know, my thoughts is that we do we do a group of 100, mm-hmm. and we do two different scripts, maybe 50 people, two groups going mm-hmm. simultaneously. Mm-hmm. That's kind of kind of a my thought right now but there's a lot to work through mm-hmm. literally this whole idea gelled you know in a very short amount of time so as you know when you're building um, any kind of, of thing you have to know what you're up against what are my costs going to be how am I going to budget this and what's it going to ultimately how do I ultimately pass that on to the consumer and I, I don't want it to be you know some sort of outrageous thing we want to we want to be you know a, a, a very fair um, uh, thing I don't I, I'm not in this to, to make all kinds of money um, I never was from the from the get-go but you know one of the, the, the things that we're kind of looking at is like Star Trek the cruise um, you know because it's like a package thing where you where you come and you get XYZ for this amount of money and I, I kind of foresee this along those lines out of necessity mm-hmm. um, so that's where we're at you know we're, we're looking at you know um, who else are we going to recruit to bring in um, you know so that the fans can be with them and, and enjoy and the stories and all of this—it's it's all in the in the earliest stages. But we we hope to be moving it forward in the next couple of months and make some announcements. And with the first one of these coming off in the spring of 2018, they'll be here before you know it. I know it. <laughs> Have you thought about pricing yet? Uh, only peripherally. Again, that's based on the talent. You know, who, who are we bringing in, and what are, what are those related costs going to be? So. You know, everything has to make sense. Uh, you you also mentioned that um, you have to balance this out with the uh, tourist traffic for the set tour. Right. So, what are kind of the time time frames in, during each year that you see these taking place? Um, initially, I'm thinking in spring and fall. Mm-hmm. Those would be the two different semesters, if you will, yeah. um, or or filming sessions. That's that's what I'm seeing right now because. You know, I'm in a in, in a tourist area, and we have so many months of that major tourism season, and I don't want to impact the tours because we are literally getting fans coming from all over for the tours. So, so this you, this this film academy is basically a um, a um, special event of the tour. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and uh, what kind of rules or restrictions has CBS set? for uh, your use of Star Trek? You know, basically that, you know, I I don't know if it's restrictions or rules. Um, We have internally discussed about, you know, the length of what we want to do. And I don't think we're going to exceed the 15 minute mark simply because logistically it's it's a nightmare. I mean, you and I have walked this path. We've we've made hour long things before and half hour. And it's it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's very tough. And... um, um, the other op- the, 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 the other thing that I see that might be an opposite, everybody has an idea of what Star Trek is and how to do it. And that's a, that's a good thing in a way. Um, could be a bad thing in another way. So I have to put my EP hat on, not my Elvis Presley hat, but my executive producer hat. <laughs> and, and basically, you know, call the shots and figure this stuff out because we, we have to be able to offer them a really unique experience, a really fun experience. Because you don't want to come to make a film and then get stressed out. You want to come and have fun. And that's my number one thing. How do I make this fun and attractive and affordable uh, for people to do? So these are all on my mind. And CBS has been very supportive. That's great. Um, have they uh, or you thought about, um, like let's say I go to, to, to the camp uh, mm-hmm. as, a, as a student 
and I come out with a film that I worked on with the rest of my classmates. Uh, can I post that on YouTube? Can I? What can I do with that? I, I, yes. I mean, I don't see why not. It's a product. It's much like the old Universal Studios tour would have been. You know, people went in, put on their costume, and they were given these lines of dialogue, and they acted it out. Some of that stuff is on YouTube. I mean, this is. It's a product. It's a. It's. A, you know, I liken it to a video postcard kind of thing, even though it's a small episode. But it's it's definitely a product. So yeah, there's no reason not to. And how? What do you think? Like, if you think of, of fan films and like there being a universe of, of fan films, um, where does this fit in? And where do how do where do other fan films stand with relation to things that come out of the academy? I don't think I, you know. First of all, anybody that goes to make a fan film is making a fan film. And they are certainly welcome to do it according to CBS and their guidelines. If you follow their guidelines, CBS has said, make all you want. Um, if you if you don't follow the guidelines, of course, you run the risk of potential legal issues, which nobody really wants that. Um, so I look at people making fan films as fan films, and I look at this as a, a kind of a pseudo fan film. It's a it's a it's an experience. You know what I mean? I don't want to tag it as a fan film, even though technically I suppose it would be. But to me, it's an experience. It's an event. You're, you're, you're going to Star Trek camp, like Space Camp, um, and you're coming out with your own film. So, um, are you familiar with Starbase Studios? I am. Uh, yep. Is that competition to this, or is it two different kinds of things? You know, that's, look, is it competition? I'm not the one that would say that. I, I, I can't speak to that. I'm not inside CBS. I'm not a lawyer. I, I don't really know. Um, I would say that if you're building out a, a studio to compete with a licensed product, that would probably be a no-no. Uh, but again, it's not my game, not my rules. Um, I admire the fact that so many people have have you know picked up the the fan film thing over the years. I, I think it's a testament to Star Trek itself that people want to be such a part of that universe. What I will say is that with what we're doing, you get to be a part of that universe. And you get the full knowledge that CBS is behind it, and you don't have any concerns. You know, it's much like taking a mini vacation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like going to Disney World, but for Star Trek. <laughs> so, uh, dream a little bit. In ten years, after the the Academy goes into operation, what what do fan films look like in that in oh, that God. new you know, in that I have new world? No idea. You know, listen. When we did our first one back in two thousand and three, we didn't know if we'd make another one. Um, but it was well received, so we did, and and we challenged ourselves. You know, our thing was how do we make it better each time? Because it made us better, uh, theoretically. You know, made us better storytellers, better filmmakers, better actors. Even though we're, even though we were none of that, we <laughs> we aspired. You know what I mean? We wanted to just do a good job. It, you know, the, my 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 biggest happiness is that people watched them and loved them. My biggest sadness is that it. It spurred people on uh, to do things that they shouldn't have done. They, you know, it, it 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 lends itself to people getting into this competitive nature, which should never be, you know, because making your Star Trek fan film is about celebrating the love of Star Trek and playing it with your friends. It should never be about how do I one up this one or how do I one up that one. And sadly, there was a lot of that, you know, going on, which was totally unnecessary. So those were my my personal feelings. Okay, a little uh, controversial question. Um, Rob Burnett is is claiming credit for this for this idea that it wouldn't have happened except for Axonar. What what do you have to say about that? Wow, uh, you know whatever, to each his own. You know, I know I know where the ideas came from. You know, I've been doing fan films much longer than Rob Burnett or anybody else. I know the discussions we've had. You know the discussions that were had. Um, we talked about these kinds of things for years before anybody else was making these kinds of things so and that includes you and, and Hidden Frontier we were having these conversations oh, yeah. Yeah. long before anybody else so whatever you know so uh, any last things you, you think people should know uh, as, as you move now towards uh, getting up and running and then starting the, the, the first one in the spring it's not, the, only, the only thing that I would like people to take away is that this is this is again about sharing this passion that we all have. This is about getting together to make Star Trek, to play Star Trek. This is about them building a memory, you know, working with, with, with people that they've idolized and, and getting to wear those clothes in that environment. We both know what that feels like. And it's a feeling that you can't describe if you're a Star Trek fan um, when you do it. It's, it's like, 
you know, mana from heaven, so to speak. So that's what I want. I, I'm hoping for people that they'll have that same feeling that we got to get when we did it, when we actually made, you know, full blown fan films. Well, staying on Axe Enough for just one more question. Do you think this is CBS trying to repair some of the damage that the lawsuit did? Well, obviously, I can't speak for CBS, but uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, the effort that they're going to, to both acknowledge the, uh, the power of fan films to uh, create opportunities for, for regular fans to, to actually participate in creating Star Trek, that's, uh, I think that's, a, that's an outreach that we've never seen before from a major IP holder um, uh, in the substantive way that, uh, that we see here in this idea. Um, I think that it's it's an acknowledgement that the hard work that so many fan productions have put in over the years is, is paying off in terms of CBS taking this gamble and saying, okay, let's let's see what we can do with this. Let's see uh, if fans really want to participate in this kind of creative activity, and let's provide a means to do it. And James had a, uh, a model that works. He has uh, a set that works. He has. Uh, connections with people in the industry uh, who, who will work for this. Uh, so everything came together in a way that, uh, yes, I think uh, offers the opportunity to CBS uh, to uh, show fans that it cares to give them the kind of opportunities they want. Knowing now that James intends the Fan Film Academy as a bonus feature of the original series set tour, and only a couple of times a year, it'll be scripts that they've predetermined, nothing outside will be coming in. I think that my original statement of the shift in the balance of power with Star Trek fan films is unfounded now, and I very happily retract that. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of the Fan Film Academy, and you never know, James, I may be heading your way in 2018 as part of my US trip which I've been promising for years. I reckon it's time I finally got in and got it done. Looking forward to that. Something else I'm looking forward to this year is Aaron van der Klee's second edition of his uh, Enterprise Era short film. Uh, it looks absolutely fantastic and these production stills that have come up uh, on his social media in the last few days look absolutely amazing. He's done a fantastic job once again it seems and I really hope that I can sit him down for another chat this year and see what uh, pushed him in that direction. For now though, thanks for watching this special edition of the Trek Zone Spotlight. Carlos, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the con, enjoy Vegas. Really appreciate your time, man.